live from Anaheim, California, it's theCUBE, covering Nutanix.next 2019. Brought to you by Nutanix. Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of Nutanix.next here in Anaheim, California. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, John Furrier. We are joined by Gene Kim. He is an author, researcher, entrepreneur, and founder of IT Revolution. Thank you so much for coming back on theCUBE, Gene. Oh, thanks so much, Rebecca, and always great seeing uh, you and John. So you are a prolific author. You've written many books, including The Phoenix Project, uh, The DevOps Handbook, you have a new one coming out. But this is, this is the latest one we have here, The DevOps Handbook. Yeah, that was 2016, and uh, we came up with another book called Accelerate, based on the State of DevOps Report. And uh, yeah, it's been a fun ride. Uh, just uh, what a great space to be writing about. DevOps has been obviously you know, covered going back years. Now it's mainstream. And you're starting to see the impact of people who have like taking a DevOps mentality, put products into place. We see all the you know, web scalers from Facebook, you name them. But now the enterprise is, is now really looking at agility. It's an area you've been working a lot on. You host the Dev, uh, DevOps Enterprise Summit. What's that been like? I mean, <laughs> it seems to be taking longer <laughs> than some of the hardcore cloud guys. So what's the state of the union, if you will, for the enterprise from a DevOps standpoint? Yeah, what a great question. I mean, I think there's no doubt that the DevOps principles and practices were pioneered in the tech giants, the Facebooks, Amazon, Netflix, and Googles, but uh, you know, I've long believed with uh, a certain level of certainty that uh, as much economic value as they've created, uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. The real value will be created when you know, the largest, most complex organization on the planet uh, adopt these same principles and patterns, and when you have, uh, you know, I think IDC said there's 18 million developers on the planet, of which at maximum, you know, a half million are at the tech giants. The rest are in, you know, the largest brands across every industry vertical. And if we can get those 17 and a half million developers as productive as if they were at uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, I mean, that generates trillions of dollars of economic value per year. And when, you know, with that much um, uh, economic value being created, I mean, that will have, uh, you know, undoubtedly, you know, incredible societal uh, improvement outcomes as well. So yeah, it's been a, such a treat to help chronicle that journey. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you, Gene, is that those are no impressive numbers, but also if you factor in net new developers, yes. younger yeah. generation, reskilled workers. I used to be a network guy, now I'm a developer. Yeah. You're seeing developers really at the in infrastructure level now, a show like this, where Nutanix is a hard, was a hardware company, they're now a software company. So they are at the heart of DevOps in terms of their target audience, they're implementing this stuff. So this is a refreshing change. So I got to ask you, when you walk into an enterprise, what is the current temperature <laughs> of, or IQ of DevOps? Are, they, are there a percentage that's you know, are there, some are learning? Take us through kind of the, the progress. Yeah, if I were to guess, right? And this is, uh, as much as I love uh, statistics and uh, you know, comprehensive benchmarking, yeah, I, I think we're 3% of the way there, right? 3%? Uh, yeah, I mean, just, uh, yeah uh, you know, we're in the earliest stages uh, of it, which means the best is yet to come. Um, I think DevOps is an aspiration uh, for many, um, and you know, but having to change the, uh, you know, I think DevOps is often a, rebelli a group rebelling against an ancient powerful order, right? You know, <laughs> uh, forces um, far beyond their control, conservative groups um, you know, protecting their turf. I mean, I think that's kind of the, uh, the, the, probably the typical situation, and so, you know, we're a long way away from DevOps being the, the dominant orthodoxy. So, if that's the case, there's probably some people who have adopted it had success. We're seeing that in these new innovative shifts, yeah. the early adopters have massive value yeah. uh, extraction from that. So, and that's an advantage, competitive advantage. Can you give us some examples of uh, people who were, did that, took the rebellion, yeah. got, went to DevOps, were successful, and then doubled down on it? Yeah, I, mean, I think um, uh, the, the ones that come to mind uh, immediately are like Capital One. Uh, you know, they went from 80% outsourcing to now almost 100% insourced. Um, same with Target, where it really started off as a, uh, uh, a bottom-up movement and then uh, gained the support of the highest levels of leadership. And it has been so exciting to see these stories not just told by um, you know, technology leaders, but increasingly shared and being told by both the technology leader and their business counterpart, uh, where uh, the business leader is saying, I am wholly reliant upon my technology peer to achieve all the goals, dreams, and aspirations of you know, our organization. And that's, yeah. you know, what a treat to be able to see that kind of recognition and appreciation. 
it's an operational shift too. They have to buy into changing how they operate Absolutely. as a company. Yes. And IT, believe me, they're like clutching on to the, <laughs> the old ways. And, and that's just the way it is. The There's a wonderful phrase um, from the Nutanix CEO that I loved is that we often characterize the developers as the builders, but you know, operations infrastructure, they are builders too. In fact, uh, you know, developers cannot be productive if they are mired in infrastructure, right? And so, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you know, you get peak productivity, focus, flow, and joy when you don't have to deal with concerns outside of the, the business feature and the business problem you want to solve. And I know that from a personal uh, experience where the frustration you have when you just want to do one thing and yeah, you've just carved out you know, eight or 10 things that you just can't do because, uh, or you have to puzzle. Yeah. These are puzzles that you have to solve. I'd love to get your reaction to um, some of the trends that I'm seeing, because DevOps has been such an important movement, at least from my standpoint, because people, people can get lost in the, what the word means. Yeah. At the end of the day, programmability, making infrastructure as code, which yeah. was the original ethos, making the infrastructure programmable and invisible, which is one of the themes of Nutanix, was the dream. That kind of is the objective, right? I mean, to make it programmable so you don't have to stand up all these services and prep and provision hard infrastructure yeah. stuff. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, uh, in November, the Unicorn Project is coming out, so that's a follow on to the Phoenix Project. And uh, what I'm really trying to do is capture how great it feels when you can be productive and all of infrastructure is taken care of for you by your friends and infrastructure, right? And it allows you to you know, have your best energy focusing on solving the business problem, not on <laughs> how to connect A to B, and, you know, which needs to be connected to C, and the YAML files, and uh, configuring you know, all these things that you don't really care about, but you're forced to, right? And um, uh, I think that allows uh, a level of productivity and joy, uh, but also uh, 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 is that the ideal working relationship between development and infrastructure where developers are constantly thanking their infrastructure peers for making their life easy. Yeah, <laughs> we were joking, Rebecca and I were joking about how we use Siri. Hey, Siri, what's the weather at Palo Alto? This should be an app for the enterprise that says, hey, Cube, or whatever, at Nutanix, or whatever. <laughs> Give me some more storage. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why isn't it happening? <laughs> so that's, but that's, that's, the, that's kind of a, a joke, but it's kind yeah. of a goal. Oh, increasingly, right, that's just available on demand, right? Yeah. Uh, and you certainly don't have to open up 30 tickets these days like was so typical 10 years ago. I mean, that, that's a modern miracle. My question for you is why books? I mean, so here, here we have, we're in this very fast changing technological environment and landscape. And as you said, the DevOps is still relatively new. There's, it's not, it's 3% yeah, yeah. really who understand it. Um, why use a bunch of dead trees <laughs> to get your message across? Well, I like writing. In fact, okay. I mean, in an ideal month, I mean, I get to spend half the time writing and half the time hanging out with the best in the game, studying you know, the, the greatest in the field. Um, and I think even in this day and age, uh, there's still no more effective and viral mechanism to spread ideas in books. Um, you know, when people, someone says, uh, hey, I love the Phoenix Project, I loved reading it. I mean, it says a couple things, right? They probably spent eight hours reading it. Uh, and you know, that's a serious commitment. And, and so uh, I think, um, imagine how many impression minutes you know, it takes to purchase eight, minutes, you know, eight hours of someone's time. Yeah. And, and so for things like this, I really do think that um, you know, the written form is still one of the most effective ways to uh, communicate ideas. You get, the, you get the dream job, you're writing and hanging out with the, the best people. What, did you, what have you learned from the, these people? Oh my goodness. Um, you could write a book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for 20 years, I've self-identified as an operations person. Uh, even though I was formally trained as a developer, I got my graduate degree in compiler design in 1995. And so for 20 years, I just loved operations just because that's where the action was, that's where the saves happened. But something changed. About four years ago, I learned a programming language called Clojure. It's a functional programming language. It's a, a Lisp, so very alien to me the hardest thing I've ever learned. I mean, I must have read and watched 80 hours of videos before I wrote one line of code, but it has been the most rewarding thing, and it's just been, uh, it's actually brought the joy of development and, and coding back into my daily life. So, uh, so I guess I should amend my answer. I would say it's half the time writing, half the time hanging out with the best in the game, and 20% coding, just because uh, uh, I love to solve problems, right? Uh, you know, my own problems. So, uh, so I've, I, I would thank the people I get, to, I, you know, I've been able to hang out with and had the privilege to watch, just because um, if it weren't for that, I'd, I think I would have been happy, you know, just saying that coding was uh, 
a thing of the past, right? Uh, so th for that, I'm so grateful. Well, how do you use what you learn about uh, in terms of your writing yeah. and in your coding and vice versa? I mean, so how are they different and how are they the same? Oh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, you know, I think what's really nice about coding is that it's, uh, it's very formal. I mean, in fact, uh, the most, at the extreme, it's all mathematics, right? Um, uh, books are just a pile of words that uh, may or may not have order and structure. <laughs> and so, uh, in the worst days, uh, I felt like with the Unicorn Project, I wrote 150,000 words, target word count is 100,000, and I was telling friends, I wrote 150,000 words that say nothing of significance, right? <laughs> you know, what have I done? Um, yeah, in the best days, uh, and that's, I think that's because you have to impose upon it a structure and, and a point, right? Uh, so on the best days, uh, it's very much like coding. Everything has a spot, right? Uh, uh, and uh, you know what to get rid of. So uh, yeah, I, I think the fact that coding has structure, I think uh, makes it in some ways an easier form to work with. And what brings you to Nutanix next this week? What's the story? What's oh, the focus? I, I got to take. I had the uh, privilege and uh, was delighted to take part in uh, what they call Dev Days. So it, uh, they were gathering developers to learn about, you know, to educate everyone on how to use uh, the Nutanix capabilities through APIs, just as you said, right, to help enable automation. And, and uh, I just found that very rewarding and fulfilling, uh, just because even though I think Nutanix. Uh, as a community is known for being the, uh, uh, the innovators and the, uh, uh, so the rebellion, <laughs> right? Uh, as productive as you know, that technology has made them to turn into an automatable platform, you know, I think that's another order of magnitude gain in terms of value they can create for their organization. So that was a treat. And they've transformed from an operations oriented box company years yeah. ago and now officially subscription based software, they're going all software. Yeah, right, uh, I right, mean, right. they're flipping their model upside down too. And it was just a delight to see the developers who are attracted you know, to that one day thing. I would recommend uh, to anyone who's interested in development uh, and just being on the cutting edge of what can be done with, um, for example, if you had cameras in every store, is there a way to automate the analysis of that to compute dwell times and um, you know queue abandonment rates? I mean, <laughs> it's like a crash course in uh, modern um, business practices that I, I thought was absolutely um, amazing. Well, Gene, you do great work. I've been following you for years. I know you're very humble as well. Give, but give a plug, take a minute to explain the things you're working on. You got a great event you yeah. run, you got the books. What other things you work, got going on? Share with the audience. Oh, just those two things. I work, uh, just everything's about the book right now. The Unicorn Project is coming in November. Uh, and so excerpts will be available um, at the DevOps Enterprise Summit in London. Uh, so that's a conference for technology leaders uh, from large complex organizations. And over the years, uh, we've now chronicled over 250 case studies by technology leaders from almost every brand across every industry vertical. And uh, this has been such a privilege to see, hear the stories, and to see how they're being rewarded for their achievements. I mean, they're being promoted uh, yeah. and uh, being given more responsibility, so that is a, a treat beyond words. And it's a revolution, it's a shift that's definitely happening. You're in the, been in doing it for years, and we're yeah. documenting it, so, and you are as well. I'm looking forward to seeing <laughs> you there. <laughs> awesome. I just have one final question, and this is about something you were saying about how Nutanix is the, the insurgent and the, yeah, the rebel, the, re yes. the, the rebel in all of this. How does it, how do you recommend it, as a researcher, as an entrepreneur yourself, and as someone who's really in this mindset, how do you recommend it stay feisty and scrappy uh -huh. and, and with that mentality, especially as it grows and becomes more and more of a behemoth itself. Um, uh, there were some statements made about like how 10 years ago virtualization was the, the one key certification that was kind of guaranteed you relevance uh, forever in the future. And <laughs> yeah, I think there's some uh, basis to say that you know, that alone is not enough to guarantee lifetime employment. And you know, I think the big lesson is um, you know, we all have to be continual learners and uh, you know, every year that goes by, you know, there are more miracles being, uh, uh, being created for us to be able to use to solve problems. And uh, boy, if that doesn't, uh, I think the lesson is you know, if we're not uh, always focused on being a continual learner, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, there's great joy that comes with it and uh, great peril you know, if um, we choose to, to forego it. Great, well that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much for coming back on theCUBE, Gene. Thank you so much and uh, great seeing you both. Thanks. 
I'm Rebecca Knight for John Furrier. We will have much more from .next just after this.